Thank you for the uh, very generous introduction and um, welcome such an illustrious audience. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, I'm very pleased to be here today and, um, and to be um, involved in uh, one of the, the earlier parts of the um, IGP inter for the uh, soundbite. And so I'm going to talk, you, talk to you today about using my perspective as a designer and as an entrepreneur uh, to confront um, a number of global challenges of which uh, this is the first and the one I'm going to be talking to you about today is predominantly around waste and how we can look to uh, redesign cities of the future. Um, so I'm going to start off by, um, by uh, introducing, uh, kind of the, setting the scene, and I think it's something that um, all, most of us are going to be um, aware of, um, which is around uh, the fact that human beings are becoming an urban species, and we're entering uh, a period, what I um, have chosen to call the Polycene, uh, the age of the city. Um, and the, kind of representing the, the rapid urbanisation that we've seen over the last 50 years and will continue to see over the, the next 50 years or so. Personally, I've always been fascinated by cities um, because of their centrality and importance, um, in both from a, in terms of our civilization and also as hubs of social and economic power. Um, and uh, as, as was mentioned in my introduction, I studied architecture here at uh, London's Bartlett School. Um, and that's where I began thinking seriously about cities for the first time and particularly around the impact they currently have on us and will increasingly have on humanity as a whole. So during my studies, um, I worked on a variety of different um, challenges and challenges which are, I think, firstly pertinent to cities and um, more enhanced by um, urban living in general. For example, I looked at how an excluded ageing population uh, could live alongside primary school children in a Montessori school in central London, uh, looking at how uh, intergenerational equity and the exchange of skills and values between young and old and the crossover in terms of uh, sharing um, and uh, both in terms of you know, the care needed for both parties and the potential as I say, exchange of values between those, those two groups. Um, I looked at how uh, a, a fictional, uh, fictional inhabitant of London in 2050 uh, might retrofit his Victorian townhouse. This is actually in, uh, in Battersea in Nine Elms and, and uh, in response to the, the paranoia and uh, news outlets warning of foreign incursion, economic crises, uh, climate change, uh, flooding, except and terrorism. Um, but most excitingly for me, I began thinking about, about waste and how we could begin to reimagine urban supply chains. Um, and this final project has eventually morphed into the business I run today, uh, BioBean, which, as, as was mentioned, is a, a green energy company that has industrialised the process of turning waste coffee grounds into two advanced biofuel products, both a diesel used for powering urban transport systems and a biomass pellet used for heating buildings, as you can see here. And so these, this is essentially just talking through the, the supply chain there. Um, I came up with the idea whilst uh, um, working on a, a design um, adjacent to my architectural studies, looking at how to design a coffee shop and coffee factory, uh, and just discovered how much waste coffee grounds there were out there. And it seems like a very uh, niche waste stream when you think of it, but the, the key thing here is that it's um, pouring out of p particularly urban centres, very dense urban centres, and also very large uh, factories controlled by a handful of companies as opposed to by millions of consumers. Um, in fact, anywhere that people pass through in large volumes, a huge amount of coffee grounds are produced 200,000 tonnes in London alone, and about half a million tonnes in the UK. And to address this, I set about by uh, you know, building a team. Uh, my my co-founder, Benjamin Harriman, was also uh, a, a postgraduate, in fact, at the Bartlett School of Architecture, um, and building a team um, and uh, looking at how to valorise this waste stream uh, and to turn it into these uh, two valuable products instead of currently a cost, both economically and environmentally, to get rid of. Um, so we've been working on this now for just, over, uh, just under two years, um, just over 18 months, um, and where have we got to in that time? Um, so the first thing to say is that we are the, the only and first company in the world to have industrialised this process. Um, to date, we've built our, our first factory. Uh, this is up in Cambridgeshire, uh, just you know, about an, hour, an hour's drive outside London, um, which has the capacity to process 150 tonnes of waste coffee grounds every day. Um, we've built a team which is um, just over 15 people, um, and by the summer it'll be about uh, 20, 22, 23 people. Um, and as, as was mentioned again, we've raised um, significant financing to take this into, into development and protected some, some quite pioneering technology in, for that as well. To kind of set the scene around uh, what's, 
uh, one ton of coffee grounds looks like, both in terms of the, the value that can be extracted from it and also the economic and environmental benefit of it. Roughly from a ton, you get about uh, several hundred litres of oil, which can be turned one to one into biodiesel. And the residual biomass can be turned into a highly calorific fuel pellet, which can be used to heat buildings. And in terms of the environmental impact from recycling one ton using our technology, uh, you save uh, 6.8 tonnes in carbon emissions. And again, to put that in perspective, saving 6.8 tonnes uh, in carbon emissions from a single tonne, that's the equivalent of driving a car from London to Hong Kong and back twice. And so it's a, it's a quite considerable saving that's from a single tonne. And, to, and our factory is able to process 150 tonnes in a single day. Um, and I suppose, stepping back to the bigger picture, what we're really looking at, I mean, for us, coffee grounds is the, the first step. Um, we're basically looking at how if we can um, look at all pieces of rubbish and how we can redesign um, different waste streams in that way. And not just waste streams, but more at the bigger picture again in terms of how we think about and live in cities. And so that's, um, I guess, my, my, my kind of what personally I gained from it. But the main thing, aside from that, I gained from my architectural education at UCL was around the importance and increasing centrality that urban designers will continue to play. Um, and traditionally, or certainly, we were taught that it was a, a profession and you would study architecture and then you'd become an architect and, um, and design buildings. And my main thinking was that we should think of this less as a profession, more, a, uh, more as, and certainly not one set aside for architects or green entrepreneurs or anyone else, more, more that anyone can, in theory, be an urban designer. It's just about thinking about things in a different way. And I think particularly with people like architects, they shouldn't limit themselves to the sphere of the, the built environment or building design, but should think um, in a more cross-disciplinary way. Um, I think that's one of the key opportunities that the policy, that the age of the city um, has provided um, for us because um, as, as we increasingly become um, urbanised, it's a chance for more and more people to become urban designers because I think we cannot uh, rely on uh, necessary governments or city governance to come up with grassroots solutions which uh, I think necessarily do often come from people who are thinking in a more cross-disciplinary way and um, I think architects are a good uh, example and testament to that. And I don't think, in terms of the centrality that urban designers have, I don't think there's really a choice that can be had here. Um, again, I think most people will be um, aware of these facts and figures, but when my grandfather was born uh, in uh, 1925, the world was 15%. Um, well, the vast majority lived in, uh, in the countryside. Only 50% was, was urban. When my father was born, uh, a, f a, few, a few years later, that had already doubled to 30% of the 2.8 billion people on the planet living in cities. And when I, apologies for these, these children's photos, but the, <laughs> when I was born uh, in uh, 1990, uh, getting on for half of the world's population was urban. And when I and uh, I think a, a lot of certainly UCL students will be uh, in their 60s or 70s, um, the, the vast majority, of over 75% of the world's uh, nearly 10 billion people uh, will be will be urban, and the and that's a absolutely extraordinary situation. For the first time in human history, we've become an urban species, and it's going to um, have to require huge amounts of innovation and change the way that we think about and design cities, uh, not just um, from scratch, but also how we can retrofit and uh, incorporate in additional um, technologies and business models and systems within that. And to put that in perspective again, what a, what a world that's 75% urban actually looks like, that's the equivalent of building a new New, new, new York City every single uh, year, not just once, but seven times every year. So adding a, an additional seven new, new York cities to our planet, um, and over the next 35 years, that gives us an additional 250 additional very, very dense, large urban areas that are going to be added to the planet. Um, and that just kind of illustrates that, that situation. And I think what certainly I'm interested in and what I'm concerned about and I think um, is shared by the Institute of Global Prosperity is around how we can make this growth both sustainable and equitable. And I think in order to do that, we need to understand the pressures that rapid urbanisation will, will impo currently imposing and will continue in to impose in coming decades. And a key part of that is that they're not just um, in, uh, independent challenges, but they're crucially interconnected. Um, from infrastructure to waste, from mental well-being to housing, from transportation to energy, 
and from water to our economic prosperity. These are not just global challenges, uh, but uniquely and interconnected urban ones. And it's clear to me that uh, cities need to change, and we can only do that once we begin to understand them. And to give you a small example of that, in order to illustrate um, what I'm talking about with regards to this, um, traditionally we think of a challenge like climate change as a global problem. In fact, we usually refer to it as global warming. Uh, but uh, take the simple fact that uh, roughly 75% of global carbon emissions can be uh, attributed to cities. Um, and of that 75%, a good portion comes from just uh, 35 megacities with populations of over 10 million people. I think that generally politicians, governments, uh, large organisations and, uh, and corporations would think about global warming very differently indeed. Um, and I think we should probably stop calling it glo global warming when it's um, demonstrably an, an urban challenge and can be solved and, and focused around cities and city living. And for me, Whilst that sounds scary in some senses, I think for me that provides a, a kind of a very exciting um, and, and empowering opportunity to an extent because if 75% of emissions are attributable to cities, that means that you can address a global challenge by, uh, by um, solving a local problem. Um, and so in the policy and in the age of the city, a local solution can have a global impact, but it's about thinking about, it's about concentrating those ideas and that's um, innovation around cities um, and city living. And so my thinking is basically that we need to have more forward-thinking and design-led solutions um, that are uh, both practical and idealistic, um, but that have a, but that uh, first identify and then address the real-world urban challenges that are going to be facing us all. And if we can successfully do that, I think that urban designers will um, become one of the most influential groups of the 21st century and responsible for maximising uh, this fantastic opportunity, um, the, the policy, the age of the city. And I'll, I'm going to talk you through some examples here because I think some of the solutions are already at our fingertips with some really exciting examples of urban design happening all over the world. Um, this is a, 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 pro, a theoretical project, I should add, in, in uh, Beijing in China, uh, which is a, a straddling bus which um, to lower congestion and pollution and transporting hundreds of people from point A to B at a fraction of a cost, allowing the traffic to funnel underneath it and it slides over the top um, there as an as a, uh, exciting infrastructure project and that's delivered at a fraction of the cost and with a fraction of emissions of traditional rail or car infrastructure. Or this a delivery drone in Chicago, um, again looking at how you can nav navigate that city both vertically and horizontally, uh, delivering packages and, and parcels around the city instead of using it again a traditional truck um, solution. Um, or this, which is a, a well-known project, certainly amongst architects in the room, um, which is uh, affordable housing in Santiago in Chile, uh, looking at, again at how uh, uh, the large slum-dwelling population in, in South America can step up the economic ladder. And these houses were uh, delivered at a, a, a few thousand dollars, um, at a fraction of the cost of traditional um, housing um, infrastructure. And again, instead of uh, fitting out all the, the furnishings beautifully and finished, it's simply providing a concrete shell putting electricity in and uh, water plumbing in and then allowing um, as they move up, uh, as, as various dwellers move up the economic ladder, they can um, retrofit it and, um, and develop it as, as they choose to do so. Um, and so, I mean, these are just three examples, but everywhere people are thinking of innovative solutions to um, match to local conditions. And these are here today. Um, and solution, and what I want to, I'm trying to suggest with these examples is that solutions to urbanism rarely come from utopian, overly idealistic ideas, but they also need to be tempered very heavily with on-the-ground, practical and design-led solutions um, that disrupt the status quo um, in a, in a, and just rethinking these challenges. And if we can shift our basic attitudes to city, cities, um, I think that will become um, an, an inevitable thing that we um, can redesign and they'll become a, something that we're very proud of instead of a lot of these challenges that they're throwing up at, at today. I think the way that we can do that is, is in how we view them from, from the start. Um, instead of viewing them as grand permanent structures that are, <coughs> that are fixed, uh, certainly when I think of cities, I usually think of the, the, the great European cities um, or, or North American cities, which are very large with some exciting buildings there and are generally um, designed by uh, very important architects and that we all read about in the history textbooks. But I think if, but these are generally fixed systems 
that do no, don't evolve. Um, and I think instead if we view them more as organisms with their systems open to being retrofitted and reformed, um, and, you know, and th that will get, deliver us with a chance to um, change the way people feel about inhabiting them. And I'm not suggesting that we start from scratch and design cities um, from the bottom up. That's, I think, historically, again, proved neither popular nor, nor effective and is generally amazingly expensive and, uh, and deeply unsuccessful. Instead, I'm an advocate for densifying and innovating um, and of piggybacking across existing infrastructure, existing supply chains, and of retrofitting, um, retrofitting examples off the back of that. And I'd like to think that uh, Bio being the company I run, and a few of the other examples I've showcased here today, are tangible examples of this. So humans are now and will continue to be uh, an urban species. And currently this is viewed as uh, a major problem, perhaps one of the greatest problems um, that, that we have over the next, next few decades, rather than how I see it as a, 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 an absolutely enormous opportunity. I think the challenges of the near future, those of pollution, transport, housing, food, water, energy, waste, overpopulation, our physical and mental well-being, gender equality and climate change, these are not global problems. Instead, they're unique and interconnected urban ones. And if they're caused by cities, it will fall to cities increasingly to solve them. And that's where urban design, designers factor into the equation. Because in the Polycene, in the age of the city, a local solution can have a global impact. And I'm going to end on a, for such a small audience, I'll end on a very grandiose note, I'm afraid. But uh, there's a, a phrase that was used in, in ancient Athens and uh, essentially swearing in a, a, a new citizen to the, to the city. Uh, they were essentially given a, a mission statement, which I think gives us a a very good um, precedent for the 21st century. We shall leave this city not less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was left to us. And my basic contention, what I'm trying to talk to you about today, is that um, everyone who um, joins us in cities has the, has the um, capability and capacity to create, to innovate and disrupt the status quo, and to leave their city greater, better, and more beautiful than it was beforehand. And I think the shape of our future um, depends entirely on how we organize reimagine and evolve urban systems. And that is why uh, uh, the city will uh, be essential to the future of humanity and why we need to design tomorrow today. Thank you very much indeed. Fantastic talk, well, fantastic talk. I particularly like the straddling bus. <laughs> <laughs> because you know, when I, one of my great things about London at the moment is somehow was there are all these buses and they're all jammed in one small road going <laughs> yeah. nowhere and you're sitting behind them cursing on your bus hoping your bus is going to start moving again very soon and obviously not going to do that. Um, I really like the idea of the policy actually. I mean, as, as you know, UCL is very taken with the idea of the Anthropocene which was talked about and my, many of the grand challenges of UCL are based on the Anthropocene idea but um, I think that the, 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 the policy idea is, is, is really attractive actually. And um, perhaps we could explore that a little bit in the, in the conversations that we have. But just for the background to, for others, um, so have you already got another idea in development beyond the bio bean, or are you, or is it top secret? Yeah, it's t uh, top secret. No, <laughs> no far, far. Um, uh, I mean, personally, I'm kind of uh, very focused on delivering biobean for at least the next couple of years yeah. because uh, it's kind of, I guess, the uh, challenge between you know, thinking at the big picture scale yeah. and then kind of operationally delivering on the day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of, kind of, broadly speaking, a number of ideas I'm mm -hmm. kind of very interested in exploring. In fact, my co-founder of a, a, a discussion forum for Students for Happiness, which we ran here at UCL, which look, was looking at um, promote, you know, putting happiness on the agenda for young people and that kind of stuff as yeah. well and um, discussing that in an open forum um, and so anything from you know waste and um, biofuels to looking at mental well-being to uh, you know some of the examples of what I looked at at architect school around um, you know aging population living alongside primary school children for instance um, which yeah, all yeah. of these things have their challenges but it's just thinking them through properly I think is the, the key thing. No, I'm very interested in the, in, the, in the waste idea we've been thinking in the last a few months in the IGP about how to tackle issues to do with waste um, and how to get um, actually the finance, banking and insurance industries involved in thinking about waste in a different kind of yeah. way. You know, um, 
not least because um, many of the challenges that are produced by waste are actually things which impact on those businesses one way or another. We've been think particularly thinking about um, all these um, oceans, um, islands rather, of plastic that float around in the ocean. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which are appalling, appalling, uh, when you see them, really, and they're huge. They're absolutely massive, and you can't believe how big they are when you see what they're like. But more worrying still is the, the new study done recently of the, <coughs> of the Yamuna, which is the ri river that runs through the centre of Delhi, New Delhi in India. And uh, it's full of waste, and it's full of a lot of these plastics. But the worst thing about the study was that it showed that in all of that horror, in the middle of, middle of it, was growing a new kind of bacteria which is resistant to all known antibiotics. So, so waste has, you know, for the control and management of waste, particularly in cities, has huge ramifying effects. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Of health and so on, which was really what most of the finance, banking and insurance industry is concerned, yeah. <laughs> concerned with now. So I think there are, there are lots of kinds of things that we could sort of that, that pick up on pick up on there. So now questions? Yeah, Anna. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was wondering um, on the subject of waste. Uh, there was uh, another young entrepreneur, a bit like yourself, who came up with a fantastic idea for dealing with plastic uh, islands of plastic yeah. pollution. And it, like your idea, it seemed to be design led but relatively simple and it didn't seem to be particularly contentious um, and it was an infrastructural change um, but there were very obvious benefits and how could you possibly um, have a, a negative response to yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. But I was just wondering if you've met with any surprising challenges to your idea um, along the way and I'm thinking specifically about insurance um, and things like that, you know, were there any that you just didn't think yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the key ch key challenges um, have, I guess, been, you know, from a personal perspective, in setting up a company. Uh, you know, you have a an unproven technology, an unproven business model, and sadly, an unproven entrepreneur. And so, it's, so it's riddled with risk. I think if you had, uh, you know, at least one of those, I think that it makes life a, a lot easier. Um, I think is the first first thing to say in terms of that. Um, one of the main challenges for generally setting up new businesses is access to, to kind of finance and seed capital. Um, and we've kind of been lucky in that we're in an economic, uh, well, perhaps not economic climate, but in, in a climate which is very receptive to that. And so we've received support from um, here, here at UCL, for instance, um, f financially and in terms of kind of business planning and that sort of stuff as well. Um, and also from you know, people like uh, the Greater London Authority, um, and even people like Shell and that kind of stuff too. So we've received pots of money from the various different people um, that's helped us kickstart the idea, which enabled, essentially took us to a place that we were able to finance it from private investment as well off the back of that. But certainly in terms of bigger institutions and what you're both talking about in terms of think companies, you know, big uh, banks and insurance companies, it's not even, I mean, you can kind of understand it because of the risk attached to it, because it is unproven on you know the three key fronts that you'd want it to be proven on. Um, but uh, that was the, and you know we still don't have any any bank finance in there or everything of that nature. Um, but I think that's a, a, a testament. I think both to uh, broadly speaking the the kind of circular economy and some of the ideas that we're talking about here. But I think also pertinent to um, any high risk early stage business or organisational idea. <coughs> the logistics organized in this model? I mean, the collection of coffee grounds, yeah. the transportation, of how was the institutional model and who pays for it, who yeah. benefits from that? And Absolutely. So I said the logistics were one of the key things to, to, to crack behind it, because once we'd um, sorted the technology, it was a, kind of a bit of a headache, as you can imagine, going through the logistics um, of it, and particularly with a, a new waste stream as well, which wasn't currently being separated out. So the first thing is that the majority of this waste, about 70% of the UK's waste, is um, produced from large instant coffee factories. Um, so produced from the freeze-drying process. So it's not all kind of you know, your, your pressure mangers in, in store. Um, a lot of it is up the supply chain. And so that means that you can send a very large articulated vehicle, which can essentially take it from point A to B, point B, and you're transporting 25 or 30 tonnes at a time as opposed to a small bin bag. The second is around uh, essentially the density of urban centres. So, again, about of, of the 70% the that's not there, the vast majority of it actually is uh, kind of uh, consumed within London. And again, a lot of that is consumed within 
uh, large transport hubs, for instance, we, we work with uh, Euston Station, all the major railway stations in London, and that works with that you can collect all those coffee grounds on site from 30 or so shops, and they're then put into one large skip or large container, and then you're hauling again, instead of a small bin bag, you're hauling uh, 10 tonnes, 15 tonnes at a time, and that's straight to our, our facility. And the, Oh yeah, so so essentially, it's a cost. First and foremost, this is a commercial uh, offering, so they save money. Uh, currently, they pay anywhere between fifty and one hundred and fifty pounds a ton to get rid of waste coffee grounds, and that's split between a uh, you know the collection gate fee and a landfill or incineration tax. Um, and so there's a they're, they're paying a lot to get rid of it, and essentially we come in, we uh, essentially get paid for the transportation of it, but we don't get paid to actually take the waste, and so. It's a, from our perspective, it's cost neutral. From their perspective, it's a cost saving of about anywhere between 50 and 75 uh, percent. Um, so, and then in addition, there are um, you know, environmental and CSR benefits. But what we found is that the, uh, I think, generally procurement departments are more interested in uh, if they can save a few pounds as opposed to um, a few tons of carbon. Um, it's, it's, well, sadly, until they put, impose a carbon tax properly. Uh, and then, into, and then the third model in terms of logistics is a backhaul model. So. With um, some big chains of coffee companies, uh, you have a, a few central depots and they deliver fresh uh, coffee grounds or fresh sandwiches and fresh milk every single day um, out from central depot and back. And it, you have an empty vehicle going back. And so instead of having an empty vehicle going back, you collect these heavy, wet coffee grounds, bring back to central depot. And again, you're collecting a 20 tons at a time as opposed to small bin bags. And so it was more about kind of understanding. I mean, from my perspective, I knew nothing about waste management or logistics and not, certainly nothing about... Um, biofuels or anything like that. So it's more about understanding the supply chain and then working out models that you could put in place behind that. Uh, yeah, there's a question about that. In terms of air pollution, do you need to raise an improvement as compared to diesel and petrol? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a, there's a, from using diesel compared to biodiesel, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so there's a, a, a very good, uh, essentially, saving of that, and that's split between both using a, a biodiesel instead of a mineral diesel, and also um, in terms of the actual valorization of those fuels in terms of that's not going into a landfill incineration, it's being turned into something good. So there's two aspects to it in terms of that. And the figure, the kind of, from our life cycle assessment, which we did collaborate with a very large corporate with, who I'm sadly not able, able to name, but from it you roughly save about 6.8 tonnes in carbon emissions for every... Um, Every ton of coffee recycled using it, and so, and then roughly that converts to biodiesel compared to mineral diesel. You're saving about eighty percent in um, direct uh, emissions in particulate matter. This is already up and running, and if it is, um, when did it start, and how's it going, and is it is it sort of expanding? What, what's the future? Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so it, it is up and running. Uh, we, we currently. So the, the factory built is able to process 150 tons a day. We currently only process about 25 tons a day. Uh, so we, there's a, the next year or so is a big ramp up period for us in terms of simply feedstock and getting the coffee grounds through. And off the back of that, that's essentially the kind of contracts we're um, negotiating and signed at the moment. Um, in terms of, uh, it's been going for a very short period of time. So I graduated about uh, just under two years ago. So it's been essentially since I graduated to, to, to now, been working on it. Um, and we've been operational for the last nine months or so. So it's still kind of very kind of early on within our within our um, kind of business cycle, basically. And is it just London, or do you, are you going to? It's it's Correct. not yeah absolutely, absolutely it's not just London. So we currently take waste from um, as as far north as Manchester, um, and in fact we've just got a, a big site that's coming on all the RBS estate is coming online. So they go up all the way to um, Edinburgh, places like that as well, um, and then big and then some of the big coffee factories which are outside London as well. But in terms of our focus which is more around where the feedstock is, the vast majority of that is in either London or those instant coffee factories. And then Europe? Yeah, well, exactly. I, I, have just, I have just come back from a tour of the port of Amsterdam, where we, it's the next logical place probably to set up in the Netherlands. Um, but in terms of our focuses, I guess, we have three kind of main opportunities that we could um, explore further, which is one is diversity in terms of feedstocks you can put through this. So coffee is you know, one, one feedstock we've explored, and it's more kind of more just you know, how we how we kind of came up with the idea and, and started out on it. You can also do similar technologies and process to a variety of different urban or agricultural uh, waste streams um, that, that can be valorised using a similar technology. Um, the second is around um, diversification in terms of end products. So we currently produce a, a pellet and a biodiesel product, but you can also produce 
whole host of exciting bits and pieces from waste coffee grounds, which are much lower volume but much, much higher value. Um, and so those can be used in uh, flavours and fragrances or pharmaceuticals and cosmetic products as well. Um, and then the third is what you're talking about is in terms of geographic expansion, because um, there's nothing unique about the UK or the Lon London coffee market, so it can be you know, as, as effectively, or probably more effectively in the Netherlands to be honest, and also looking at kind of places in you know, uh, New York and um, Singapore, where it happens to be. And, and a follow-up question, if I may, that is the process that you employ to get your so was, we, was this a well-known process? Uh, uh, it, it, did you have to you know, develop it? In any absolutely. So it was a, a combination. Some we have developed in-house, um, and then some we've either licensed in, and then the third is essentially reappropriating technologies from other industries. Uh, so one is from the powders drying industry, which was an industry, again, I didn't even know existed. One, another one was from the potash industry, from a mi big mining company in Canada. And uh, one was from an American university that we licensed. Um, and then others are uh, agricultural uh, drying um, uh, again uh, products again there. So uh, three or four different technologies which have been combined and essentially are able to vary that feedstock. Um, and the specifics we use is essentially an organic solvent which is recycled using that and um, essentially allows us to extract the oils from the, the waste coffee grounds. Okay. You said earlier that the future will in many ways depend on the actions of, of uh, urban innovators, urban designers and so forth. My feeling is that it's still quite unusual for students, for example, to really uh, engage in that activity. What do you think that universities and cities could do to, to, to promote that yeah. kind of I, I think, um, think, you know, I think having people thinking about it seriously from, from early on, I think, is a very important part of it. And that's why it's fantastic to have um, you know, new organisations such as this to, to be, to be um, you know, promoting that and thinking about that. Um, I think having not necessarily a entrepreneurial uh, module, but having people thinking about how what they're learning can be implemented and um, appropriated in, you know, in, in the real world and how it can be applied as opposed to solely theoretical. And I also think what I, um, I mentioned in the talk about how certainly architecture students, and I think that's quite specific because it is a vocational degree, but architecture students certainly are kind of, you know, you're, you become an architect and you're doing professional qualifications and you're very much funneled into becoming an architect. Um, and I think it, with that... Um, the systems thinking and the way that a lot of architects think, which is a split between both kind of practical on the ground engineering and also the utopian ideas about how we can make the world better or whatever it happens to be. I think that split is actually a very, um, you know, having those feet in both camps is a very interesting and useful uh, way to think about the world and not just buildings. And I think that, you know, I, I'm talking about architects because I studied it and I know a lot of people who are architects, but I think generally people can think outside their immediate sphere of influence and look at different ideas across the range. I think a lot more innovation will, will come from that and a lot more, f several more exciting ideas that are implementable as well. That's really interesting about you, what you said about intensification, is of course there's just been a new competition in the United Kingdom for a new garden city. Um, and the, the, the design that um, <coughs> was favoured was one which indeed followed the kind of design that you could have had from Milton Keynes, in other words, you know, lots of sprawl with lots of green space in between. And I mean, I was comparing that when I, when I gave the, the opening discussion about the prosperity for the IGP in, in October. I was looking at an, as an example of this new city which has been designed, but the building hasn't started for, in southern China, in Chengdu, which is about, I think, 54 square hectares. But all of the build is in a shape like this at the centre of it. So there are no cars in this city. The city boundary contains all of the green space around it, right, which can be used for urban agriculture and set within two valleys. So actually, it's also used for leisure. But the actual in the city itself is is intensified, yeah. so that nothing anybody's residence is no further than ten minutes from medical care, a pharmacy, a school, a shop, uh, a library, you know, a cinema, anything. Ten minutes walk. Uh, it's yeah, it's yeah, 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 yeah. And what's really exciting about that is that the it's the, China, it's the vision of chi the Chinese drive for that innovation and vision, which is very important in China, which we sort of, Europe seems to have lost its way a little bit in this, your activities notwithstanding. But, but actually, the, the firm that's designed it is a firm of British architects. Oh, really? Yeah. Name of which I've forgotten, but I'll look it up for you. But, um, but, but I think that these notions of intensification are really, are really interesting. Um, and I think we might need to think differently about 
a whole range of things coming from intensification. So in other words, different forms of sharing, which is already happening. Yeah. So, you know, Uber or, yeah. you know, um, Airbnb or all of these new forms of the sharing economy could actually take off, I think, in these, in these places of intensification. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I wondered if you had any thoughts about how intensive, you know, you're talking about the policy and how intensification itself might actually give rise to other forms of sort of social innovation. Right? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'd put things like, as, as you say, things like the sharing economy and, you know, even things like, you know, famous, um, you know, American company, like people like Nest and companies yeah. like that to mm -hmm. monitor, monitor homes, that kind of stuff, all under this bracket of kind of crucial um, technologies that are particularly pertinent to urban living. And in terms of densification, it's, it's seriously interesting because there's also a direct correlation between the density of cities and the, uh, you know, the lower carbon emissions within cities. And so in terms of thinking of these as interconnected um, challenges, there is, you know, I'm just talking about climate change because it's one I know slightly better than the others, but there's a very strong correlation between you know, density of cities because there's a, a nice quote, which is, you know, the, the journey with the fewest emissions is the one you never have to make. So if, 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 ev if everyone is, you know, you can talk a lot about low carbon vehicles and how exciting a, the Tesla Model S is or whatever it happens yeah. to be. But if you don't have to get in a Tesla because you're 10 minutes walk from, you know, yeah. the, the, wherever it happens to be, yeah. then that's the, the kind of obvious yeah. solution. And looking at kind of both vertical and horizontal mobility, which is something that I think rightly to extent, because there's obviously a piece around preservation as well within how we think about cities. But... Yeah. Um, having height restrictions in certain places has positive aspects, but also negative in terms of having lack of density within that. Um. Yes, and, that, and uh, that was very interesting, because presumably the, uh, the, the, the case you were using there was Alejandro Aravena for the, the Chile example. Yeah, the, yeah. yeah exactly. Um, you know, what, what's very interesting about that is that when he had to house that 100 families on a square hectare, or half a square hectare, yeah. um, you know, uh, Building up was an was an option, except the families didn't want to do that because they wanted to have ability to, 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 to spread, yeah, spread yeah. out. Yeah. So the so, so the actual solution was very very innovative. I, I I think the way he worked with the local community was produced a very innovative solution yeah. to that. Yeah. As people as their own builders and designers, which is something that we're really committed to in the IGP through the notion of citizen science that we that we're working on and. We're committed to having citizen scientists and citizen experts working with us on all our projects. So uh, that's something else. But Carolyn, you wanted to come in? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I was just talking of citizens. Um, uh, two things that come to mind in your presentation. One is, um, would you be able to involve the general public in um, recycling their coffee waste? Um, and maybe through local councils, because at the moment we all recycle our food waste, but it all goes into one bag. Yeah, yeah. Um, have, you, have you thought about involving citizens in that? Because I think more and more are using you know, fresh coffee at home. Of course, those who use those pods are already... Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and it just makes me think about also um, this whole process of urbanisation throughout the world, and it seems unstoppable. Um, and then, of course, the big question mark is, how do we produce enough food? And if we're thinking about urban design, um, also how to uh, create the possibility for more and more urban citizens to be food producers, yep. um, to have their access to allotments or small pieces of land, or just even more of their gardens over to food production. Yeah, yeah. Is that something you've thought about as well? It is. I mean, the, the challenge kind of, I guess, um, with, with that, and I think that um, a, a lot of people who are involved in more, I guess, a grassroots level is around, I guess, scale and also standardisation, yeah. which are both kind of, in some ways, kind of have very negative connotations in terms of, you know, what, what um, from a more idealistic perspective in terms of, how we could and should live. Um, but I think in terms of the economy we've developed is kind of one of, as again, we want, as you know, it's one of immediacy. You want to be able to go to Tesco's at three o'clock in the morning and get a, a fruit which won't grow for another six months in your country if it ever did. And you want to be able to get it from, you know, it's grown in Singapore, you know, you get, get it over it or wherever it happens to be. Um, and so I think that immediacy is something that I don't think that an urban population is going to be willing to compromise on. And so I think there's a piece around... Um, 
I, th I, th yeah, I think it's around, I think the key is about scale. And so from our perspective with, with BioBean, it's been uh, something that we do have ambitions to do, and it's more about working with um, from a grassroots level to influence the larger uh, coffee companies, um, but certainly from a perspective of actually collecting from homes or um, consolidating it. I'm a big fan, for instance, of actually you know them using those coffee grounds on their garden or whatever it happens to be for composting or to to grow um, grow vegetables off what it happens to be. But there are, I guess, um, s smaller scale solutions which are applicable to to things like that. Um, I didn't really answer your question very well. But I, I, th I think there, there are a lot of challenges that come with that. And, but I do think that if we're going to have solutions which are kind of implementable for the, for the many and a population which is 15, 20 million people in a single city or more, um, I think it would be excellent to have small um, gardens that everyone can tend to. But with the point around density and um, stuff as well, it could be a, a challenge. But I think it's something that we should think about much more seriously. Yeah. There are these very interesting guys at MIT. One of them is called Caleb Harper who are sort of busy trying to invent things like, you know, can, can you grow an aubergine on your shirt cuff and all that sort of stuff, because you know, that's what they're doing at MIT. Yeah. But one of the things that they're really interested in is this, this ver is vertical uh, yeah. growing for urban production. Um, and, you know, what kind of surfaces that will grow off and how will you, how, you know, how will you, I don't know, how will you harvest your, your grapes if you have to lead, lead out a 34-floor 34, 34 window to grow? Absolutely, I'm absolutely. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work or what the, what the you know, the, the, very, I think the part of the answer, I think, um, to Carolyn's question is possibly that in these very intense cities of the future, we're going to have to have different things working at different levels. So in a way, there won't be one solution for coffee grounds. There must be many, Absolutely. of which BioBean you know, is a large-scale one that can be intensified, but others will be doing other things at different sorts Absolutely. of levels. And I think that's probably the case for waste itself. Because actually, recycling is the one thing in in, in the life of London that is, and indeed in the life of a city like Cambridge, which has actually ruined the life of the city, absolutely ruined. So if you're fine, if you're a certain kind of standard of living, but if you go into any of the blocks in London which are now social housing, of course rubbish is only collected once a week anyway. Recycling is almost never collected. So all the stairwells and all the corridors are full of rubbish. It's been the effect of recycling. So it, it doesn't have to be that way, but that's been the effect. Yeah. If you go out onto the city of Cambridge, this is a city, a very small city with a lot of Victorian housing. Most houses, you open the front door and go straight into a front room with a very small garden in front of it. Those gardens don't really exist, so it's the pavement. So now on the pavement, every house has a massive wheelie bin, this tall and this wide, because that rubbish is so one for the garden, one for the wet waste, and one for the pavement, whatever, and they're only collected once a fortnight. Yeah. So all of the pavements of the city of Cambridge now have three large bins standing on. And the city of Cambridge seems to think that this is an excellent yeah. solution. Yeah, it's only yeah, an excellent yeah. solution because they now only collect the rubbish once a fortnight. Yeah, so yeah, that yeah, is yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's exactly, you know. One fourteenth of the cost of collecting it every day. That's a you know, yeah. clever, clever uh, tender process by a big, very big company. Very clever tender yeah, process, yeah. very clever. And, and those kinds of things, I think, are quite difficult to sort out in the scaling up. Absolutely. You can end up in a in a quite a difficult logjam with that kind of stuff. Absolutely. And and to and to, to your point again, in terms of one of the companies that we worked with for a time was a, a vertical f uh, farming uh, uh, cooperative in New York, which do some seriously interesting. Um, stuff and they have a system which has, you know, I, I'm sure again you will have know about similar solutions, which is kind of you have your aquaponics and you have your fish farm underneath, and it has, and it's a very kind of nice, uh, nice system. And I think the point on that, you know, back to your point, it's about not a one size fits all solution, um, and, and not just a recycling, but to think, you know, energy again as well is a good example, or to you know, well-being and all those, all those different challenges. Um, but I think the the danger with um, thinking about something like uh, urban farming is that we think that we can replace traditional farming with urban farming, which I don't think could happen. You can you can have more urban farming in cities, but it will, in terms of if you can have a population of uh, millions and millions of people living in cities and the amount of land that actually needs to take up that, and particularly if you want a quality of life that is even vaguely resembling what we have today, I think that's a, a major challenge. Or unless something new happens, that will change that. Thank mm -hmm. you.